Ladies and gentlemen, thanks. Uh, we can now uh, start. Uh, this is uh, the uh, last session of uh, infection and inflammation, and it's on uh, musculoskeletal and leukocyte imaging. We've got really uh, four excellent speakers. Before we start, uh, could I ask that and remind people that this is an interactive polling session, and then to participate in that, you'll have to really download the World Federation app, which I hope by now you do have. Uh, that is also for your CPD point, but also for this session, you are going to have to navigate with your icon and using the button to go to this is an interactive session. And then the questions will appear in that voting section, and then you can select the answer for when we are doing that uh, uh, submission for the interactive sessions. So which means that we will take questions after each speaker so that the interactive sessions can actually be uh, practical and feasible. So to start, of course, Yes, it is my pleasure to ask Professor Kutlan Oscar, uh, who is an expert in white labeling cells, and uh, he belongs to ISOLVE. Please, uh, Dr. Kutlan Oscar, could you give your lecture on pearls and pitfalls in white blood cell labeling? Thank you. Thanks very much, Victoria, for nice words. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, my chairpersons, good afternoon. Uh, actually, I'm, I'm speaking on behalf of ISORBE. Uh, in other words, this topic, uh, this uh, title was assigned by the president of ISORBE. So I'm, I'm speaking for them. If you don't like what I'm saying, so you could be mad at them. It's not my fault. Uh, my president and my former president, or former Madam President, are sitting right there. Uh, uh, we, as Izorbe, uh, we are working on to achieve a global standard in white blood cells, or cell labeling, I should say. Uh, we are doing that more intensively for the last 10 years. We have training programs, we have multiple training programs, and we had a few consensus papers published within those 10 years, and we have guidelines. Uh, so we are just an international organization. We cannot make regulations, of course, but uh, we are putting on guidelines together. Now, are we really there yet? Are we really there to global uh, harmonization or standardization? Uh, I think uh, we are very far from that. My answer is no. We are very, very far from that, unfortunately. But we are, we are trying to do something about it. Uh, let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. Let me give you an example from my, my personal experience. I have done tens of thousands of cell labeling procedures in my life, not because uh, of my choice. It was the years of those white blood cells. In those years, we were loaded up with requests and, and referrals. I mean, I remember my days of praying not to have, please, another add-on, because there were so many of them. And, uh, and I was very strict, actually. I was very strict in the procedures and everything. And to the best of my knowledge, I did not hurt anybody. That means I did not hurt any patients. But that's to the best of my knowledge. Can I say that for sure? Again. I don't think so, because it takes only one mistake, and, and you don't make mistakes willingly. And once you make a mistake, that patient goes home with your mistake, and, and how do you follow up? Yes, there are ways to follow up, but uh, it's not that easy. So this session, actually, my talk is all about that. We are going to have a discussion about that. And, and you may not like the regulations that I'm, be, I'm going to be talking about, because uh, 
they're kind of tough. But, uh, but again, it will be a discussion. I mean, there, there are ways to handle this. Now, where are those white blood cells now? I mean, those white blood cells when I was practicing. Uh, we don't have that many, unfortunately, uh, these years. But this is not unfortunate, because there are new modalities. There are very good agents. But the big enemy is FDG. Well, it's widely available now, and it's less expensive now. So uh, FDG is taking over, uh, mostly uh, the, the white blood cell studies. And also, as I said, growing number of risks from the healthcare settings. Well, I think this is not growing number of risks. It's growing awareness. I mean, risks were always there. And, and as you know, the cell labeling procedures are not without risks. Well, of course, the other agents, Victoria is going to talk about them, uh, involve very, very simple procedures uh, and reduces the risk and simplify the life of, of healthcare workers. Well, I don't know. It's a question mark. White blood cells, we say, are still the gold standard. But are they? I'm not quite sure about it. But they're long and complex uh, procedures. Now, I'm going to use a little bit different terminology right now. They are, they are pharmacy compounding procedures. Now, we are going to call them pharmacy compounding procedures. And the standards of uh, these procedures are different between countries, even different between institutions. So uh, there are lots of things to think about. It. So as I said, uh, in my lifetime, uh, I have seen perfect uh, setups for cell labeling. Well, not perfect. Nothing is perfect, but maybe better than the, the, the requirements, I should say, uh, setups for cell labelings. And I've seen terrible ones. And I've seen terrible ones in, in almost every country, I, I, I can tell you. I've seen people doing cell labelings right on this tabletop. And, 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 and some of them were claiming that we are using closed containers. And nothing happens. I mean, we, we have not heard about any, 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 any trouble. Well, this is, this is not acceptable, of course. Again, this is affecting the quality. Quality means usefulness to the patient. And this is affecting the risks. I mean, if we have to choose between the usefulness and the risks, I would sacrifice from usefulness. I mean, if they're 80% useful, I can accept it. But if they're 80% risk-free, I would not accept that. So ISORBE is, is doing uh, guidelines for the minimum requirements, and we publish them. And we are doing training programs leading to a certificate. I'm going to tell you a little bit about that. So training is possibly is a very good way of tackling this problem. So we are training the, the competent staff to, to take care of this. But of course, training is one way of tack tackling this problem. The second way is regulations and enforcement. And I'm going to talk about this regulations and enforcement a little bit. Now, in uh, 2009, uh, we had a consensus, an ISORBE consensus. And we had a panel discussion. Actually, we had, uh, at that time, we, we, we regret to miss uh, Mike in that consensus, in that, uh, in that uh, panel discussion. But the uh, rest of us was there. And, and this was discussed by all of us. And we ended up with. Ah, here, actually, this is uh, some of us uh, in that panel discussion. This is 2009, uh, about eight years ago. Uh, and again, one year after the regulations was enforced in the United States. 
I'm going to talk about that regulations. So we were quite, quite on time uh, to do this consensus. This is our published consensus in European Journal of Nuclear Medicine. So we kind of uh, dictated the, the minimum requirements at that time. And we said, you know, we need a qualified person. Uh, and we described that. And then we described a certificate program, uh, including courses and on the job training period. And then we said, we will start immediately to you know, hold those courses in different countries, and we did. I think we have done the first course uh, in, in Dubai, because, I mean, this is just a coincidence that I was a consultant for Dubai Health Authority at that time, and I told them, you know, would you like to have a course here? And they said, well, we would like to. And then we had the first course. It was an international course. And this is the course, actually. I will just keep it for a couple of seconds here that you could just take a look at that. And, and those are the lectures for the first day. Again, I will keep this one for a couple of seconds. These are the lectures. This is the first course, actually. For the second day. And this is the third day. And this is really very interactive and very practical. And then we have a requirement of six months on the job training under a supervisor approved by us. So it would be, of course, an authorized nuclear medicine physician or authorized nuclear medicine pharmacist. So they will label certain number of white cells, certain number of uh, red blood cells, and, and platelets. Platelets is not a requirement. I mean, it, it, it's optional. And then a final report come to us from that tutor, uh, and then we will issue a certificate. This is the, the worksheet uh, of, of that uh, on-the-job training supervision. <laughs> Now, we have also uh, guidelines for our procedures. And uh, the people who attended to our courses would get this kind of labeling uh, with indium oxygen and, and with technetium HMPAO. Uh, quite high yields uh, of labeling and very short time period, actually, sh sh as, as short as possible. Uh, of course, I mean, this doesn't mean too much. Even if you get 50% labeling, I'm not worried about that. You're cleaning up anyway. But with indium oxygen, with our procedure, you don't, you don't have to clean up, actually. I mean, if you know that it's 95%, but you don't know that, you still do the separation. And we also require from our students, from our trainees, that they would send us these chest images, the first our chest images, periodical chest images, that would show us the quality of their job. So this will be also reviewed by our uh, training committee. Now, again, indium oxygen is the best, uh, but I put this slide uh, just because I would like to show you this part here. This part here. Indium oxygen is best, but that part is very troublesome. Now, I have seen some institutions using a full vial of indium oxygen. Sometimes a vial of indium oxygen comes pre-calibrated and it's two millicuries. And they've been using two millicuries of indium oxygen. I've seen a number of institutions like that. And I, I, I really don't like that. I mean, this is, uh, this is terrible for our lymphocytes. And we, we, we have a limit for lymphocytes, and this is highly exceeding that limit. Technetium, on the other hand, is much better radiation dosimetry-wise, but still, this part here is not trouble-free. So it, it is not uh, free of problems. So we have to really 
pay attention to technetium also, and, and do not use extreme amounts of technetium. But not as bad as, as indium, actually. I mean, I, I'm, I'm more worried about indium. And I've seen institutions doing something very, very strange. They are using a full vial of indium, and then they are not injecting everything. They are injecting only 500 microcuries and, and throwing the rest of it, which is even worse, because you are getting the same amount of radiation dose to lymphocytes anyway. Now, the risks are, I'm not going to spend too much time on this. You already know that. I mean, the main problem is, is, is contamination, contamination and, and infection. So uh, there are a number of sources that, that we could have contamination. Now, this is a reality. I don't know if you have seen this, this paper. Uh, this is terrible, actually. I mean, uh, and it was, it was caught, and it was published, and it was, of course, uh, submitted to the authorities and everything, but not every one of them are caught like this. Uh, some, of, some of them would go without our knowledge. Now, Isorbeck consensus was published uh, after our agreement, uh, after big negotiations, I tell you. Uh, I was kind of too strict on those negotiations, and my friends were saying, you cannot be, you know, then, then you would kill the procedure. And we kind of uh, found uh, an optimal way. Uh, and we said, well, still looking at the existing, existing regulations, of course. We said, this is a guideline. Isorbeck cannot enforce anything. This is a guideline. We should have at least a grade A laminar flow hood uh, to do this. And then it has to be normally, it has to be in a buffer room, which is grade C. But if you don't have that, we are OK with a segregated area, clean segregated area, which is less than Great C. But still, it should be clean and it should be uh, uh, separated from everything. And then, again, after negotiations, well, I mean, if they are not going to afford a centrifuge, refrigerated centrifuge, okay, you can have a non refrigerated centrifuge, but then you cannot exceed this speed because you're going to destroy the cells. And this was also in our consensus. And of course, we suggested regular cleaning procedures and disinfection procedures. Now, one year before that, FDA published and, and enforced this regulation. This was a guideline. 2008, it became a regulation, and it was enforced in the United States because there are so many problems. And, and this was so many problems from healthcare settings, so many infections from healthcare settings. So, so this USP 797 was enforced. But at that time, uh, there was nothing for white blood cells. They didn't, they didn't go into white blood cells, but they went very quickly into radiopharmacy compounding procedures. Now, I'm not going to bore you with these things, but what they want from you, from, from the users, from the authorized users, to assign your risk level. Are you at low risk level or medium risk level or high risk level? You have to assign that first. And then if you are low and med medium risk level, this is this is your requirement. You are supposed to have a laminar flow hood. This is not white blood cells or, or platelets. I'm not talking about them right now. I'm talking about compounding. Compounding in a radio pharmacy. Compounding in a pharmacy. You have to have this laminar flow, grade A, and it should be located in a grade C room. This is a clean room. And then there is no need for an anteroom. But then quickly, 
nuclear medicine community was in touch with the committees, and then they started negotiating uh, the, the conditions, and they gave us uh, some exemptions. And this is published. I'm going to uh, provide that to you. This is published uh, in, in here. Then they said, if you are preparing radiopharmaceuticals, and they have a shelf life less than 12 hours, then you don't need to put your laminar flow hood in a great C buffer room, which was a big relief. Otherwise, all the radio pharmacies were going to be closed. So this was a, a good uh, exemption for us. Uh, then then you, ne you need to separate that, that room, though. But then, a couple of years after the regulations, well, you have to assign your risk level, right? Then we started negotiating with the, with the committee at the end, but unfortunately, white blood cells are considered medium level, not low level, because they are longer procedures, and they are complex procedures, and they have multiple reagents. I'm glad that they didn't say high risk level. If they said high risk level, we were shot. We could have done anything. They are medium risk, then that means that you cannot have a segregated area. You have to have a buffer room, which is a clean room for white blood cells. This is United States talking, I'm talking about. Because medium risk level is this. I mean, it's very, very clear, multiple small volume reagents compounded. So this fits. And considering that blood is not sterile, but they still, they were okay with that. I mean, if they said that blood is not sterile, so we are going to high risk level, then, then we were dead. High risk is this. Then, this is the conditions. White blood cells must be done in, in those conditions. And USP requires also all manipulations shall be separated. And also blood uh, control should be there. I mean, they have to, they have to comply with the occupational safety health also. And very importantly, this Centrifuge and dose calibrator are to be designed for only for that. And, and you, cannot, you cannot use your radio pharmacy dose calibrator for white blood cells or platelets. That, that's, and I have seen this also. I mean, people are using their dose calibrator. They are preparing radio pharmaceuticals and they are preparing white blood cells and they are using the same dose calibrator, which is not acceptable. Okay, very quickly. Okay, uh, well, once you have a clean room, you have to have that, and then you have to have your specifications. This is my clean room, this is my specifications, then you have to comply with this. After that, I'm telling you, I'm just showing you those things because a clean room means additional requirements. You have to comply and you have to document all these things and you have to uh, show them to the inspectors. You have all these requirements for a clean room. All these requirements for a clean room again. This is USP again. It's, this is not me. I'm just giving you the USP information. This is the, the design. And this is my unit, actually. And your dose calibrator is right there, actually, right inside that clean, the laminar flow hood. And you have to do surfaces. Uh, and this is the, the reference uh, that you could look at. And this is the other reference, which is exceeding the requirements. I, I like this. I mean, they have a, a setup for white blood cells and, and radio pharmacy exceeding USB 797. And this is the reference for exemptions. So this is what I have to say. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Can we call uh, Dr. Christopher Palestro, please?
Um, we are going to hear from him molecular imaging of infection in the prosthetic joint. He is really a referent, and it would be a great pleasure, I know, for all of us. And he is also an ISORB uh, member and past president of the society. Please, Christopher. Thank you, Victoria. All right, well, you can see, and these data are somewhat old, but nevertheless, it was estimated that by, at this point, eight years ago, there would be more than a million uh, total lower extremity joint replacements performed annually in the United States, and that number continues to grow. And the most common complication following uh, lower extremity arthroplasty is that of aseptic loosening, Prosthetic or periprosthetic infection, which is probably a more appropriate term, is a relatively infrequent complication with 2% or less in primary arthroplasties and uh, infections affecting approximately 6% or less in revision arthroplasties. Aseptic loosening can be the result of uh, a variety of different causes, but it's now recognized today that far and away the most common cause is that of an immune response on the part of the patient's body against the foreign body that has been inserted into that individual. It's related to the prosthetic components, so it can be secondary to the placement of the plastic liner, which sometimes fragments, uh, a reaction against the polymethyl methacrylate, the cement, and even a reaction against the metallic components because the metallic ions can leach out into the bloodstream. It can be a very aggressive process. It's characterized by a synovial-like pseudomembranous structure that forms. There are features of rheumatoid arthritis and foreign body reaction. The cellular, and there is a, in fact, it can be a very intense leukocyte response. And that cellular composition is comprised primarily of histiocytes, giant cells, sometimes lymphocytes and plasma cells, but it's important to note that neutrophils are rarely present around the aseptically loosened inflamed arthroplasty. As I said a couple of moments ago, infection is a relatively uncomplication of joint replacement surgery, less than 2% of primary and less than 6% or less of revision arthroplasties. These infections typically are classified as early, those with, uh, that occur within about three months after insertion of the device, delayed three months to one year, in some cases two years post-insertion, and finally late, more that occur more than one year post-insertion. Uh, the early and delayed infections are thought to be most often due to organisms that are introduced at the time of surgery, whereas late uh, infections are thought to be related to hematogenous spread from another site of infection. The most common offending organisms include Staphylococcus, Staphylococcus epidermidis and Staph aureus. Occasionally E. coli, Enterococcus faecalis, Group B Streptococcus, and Propionibacterium acnes. The uh, infection or the periprosthetic infection is characterized by an interaction between the microorganisms, the implant, and the host. Remember that the implant lacks micro the microcirculation that's critical to host defense mechanisms and to antibiotic delivery, which is why you don't successfully cure an infected arthroplasty by, by uh, antibiotic treatment alone. It almost always has to be removed. The microorganisms, the offending microorganisms, grow in a biofilm or a glycocalyx, sometimes described as a slime, a bioslime, that's resistant to both external and internal envi environmental factors, such as the host immune system and antibiotics. So we have poor circulation, and we have microorganisms that essentially envelop themselves in a protective coating. The cellular composition in the, in the, or I should say, the composition of the cellular response and in infection. Again, you can see histiocytes. You can have giant cells, lymphocytes, and plasmacytes. But invariably, the infected arthroplasty is characterized by an intense neutrophilic migration. And just to compare the cellular response in aseptic loosening versus infection, the key difference between the two, and this explains why labeled leukocyte imaging is so successful in these individuals, is that neutrophils, which are invariably present in the infect or around the infected device, are almost always absent or very few in number around the aseptically loosened device. <laughs> 
The differentiation of aseptic loosening and infection can be challenging. Clinical signs of infection may be, and in fact often are, absent. Laboratory tests such as uh, circulating white count, the sedimentation, right, and sedimentation rate, and C-reactive protein levels lack sensitivity or specificity or both. Joint aspiration with gram stain and culture is the definitive preoperative diagnostic test for prosthetic joint infection. However, um, it is more accurate, more reliable in the knee than in the hip. Generally has a high specificity at both locations, but the sensitivity is more variable, generally being lower in the case of hip as opposed to knee replacements. And therefore, it's not surprising that imaging studies are often used in the diagnostic evaluation of these patients. The treatment of aseptic loosening and infection are considerably different. Aseptic loosening, typically, aseptic loosening typically is successfully managed by a single stage arthroplasty, one hospital admission. That is, in with the old and out with the new in the same setting. And treatment of the infected joint replacement is more complicated, typically requires an excisional arthroplasty with antibiotic therapy, a protracted course for weeks, sometimes up for months, and eventually a revision arthroplasty requiring at the very least two and oftentimes more hospital admissions. So what's the role of nuclear medicine or nowadays molecular imaging in a painful joint replacement? Well, we can treat nuclear medicine as a screening test or we have nuclear medicine tests that can be used more specifically for diagnosis. The tests that we have available include bone scintigraphy, bone gallium and should be gallium 67 scintigraphy, leukocyte marrow imaging, and FDG. What about the bone scan? The role of the bone scan, I think, is probably limited to that and is most useful as a screening test. Changes in periprosthetic uptake patterns over time can be helpful in giving us an idea as to whether or not the complication or the patient's symptoms, I should say, uh, are related to the joint replacement. But it is important to note, not a lot of data have been published, but the data have, that have been published uh, note that the three-phase bone scan does not improve the accuracy of the test. Here's an example of a normal right total hip replacement. And the definition of normal periprosthetic uptake on a bone scan is periprosthetic uptake that is indistinguishable from adjacent and non-articular bone. So here's the right hip arthroplasty, and as you follow the periprosthetic activity down towards the remainder of the femur, there really is no difference in the intensity of uptake. Now here's a case of a patient with a painful right knee arthroplasty. Here it is at one year old. There's mildly increased activity around both the femoral and tibial components. It's hard to know what to ascribe that to. For whatever reason, no intervention occurred. Patient's pain persisted or perhaps got worse, progressed, and a year later or two years after insertion, notice the dramatic change in the periprosthetic uptake around the tibial component. So we know at this point that clearly the patient's symptoms are related to the uh, arthroplasty itself, whether or not this represents aseptic loosening, infection, combination of loosening infection or some other complication, however, we can't tell on the basis of the bone scan. Two separate patients, three-phase bone scans, an infected right total hip arthroplasty and an aseptically loosened right total hip arthroplasty. If anything, the changes around the aseptically loosened device are more impressive than the changes around the infected device. These are data on label, combined labeled leukocyte marrow imaging that go back more than 30 years. I believe that there may be one more paper that I haven't included on this. The important thing to note that despite the fact that these are single institutional studies, the specificity of the test in virtually every series that has been published has been quite high, and the sensitivity of the test in all but three of the published studies have also been quite high. A couple of examples, this is labeled leukocyte marrow imaging, uh, an infected right hip knee, excuse me, right knee arthroplasty, and if this uh, case is, is red in isolation, um, certainly people would look at this and say this likely represents infection comparing right to left, 
But when you look at it with the combined bone marrow imaging, yes, it is in fact positive for infection, but this area that immediately draws your attention on the white cell study is nothing more than marrow activity. The abnormal labeled leukocyte accumulation is in the region of the knee joint and tibial component, uh, and you can see the mismatch here on the sulfur colloid image. Again, another example of an aseptically loosened device. Looking at the white cell study alone, one could easily uh, be concerned that this represents an infected knee arthroplasty, but when combined with the bone marrow imaging, the distribution of activity on the two studies is virtually identical, and hence the combined study is negative for infection. A couple of points to keep in mind that the area of mismatch when interpreting white cell marrow scans almost always occurs in the region of the joint. Why that is, I really don't know. That may simply be where there are a sufficient number of white cells that uh, accumulate that allow us to, uh, to recognize that mismatch or whatever it is. I really don't have an answer to, for that. It doesn't mean that you can't see areas of mismatch elsewhere around the prosthesis, but even when we do, Almost invariably, the area or the, an area of mismatch is found in the joint itself. So you want to scrutinize the joint when you're reading these studies. It's equally important to keep in mind that the intensity of uptake on the labeled leukocyte study is irrelevant. And here are uh, two examples. Here we have an infected right hip arthroplasty. The white cell study alone could easily be interpreted as negative for infection, and yet when we combine it with bone marrow imaging, you can see the area of mismatch in the hip joint. In contrast, we have an aseptically loosened left total hip arthroplasty. On the basis of the white cell study alone, this could easily be interpreted as consistent with or at least suggestive of infection, but when combined with the bone marrow image, again, the distribution of activity on the two studies is virtually identical, and hence the combined study is negative for infection. A couple of things that you want to keep in mind, and it makes life easier if you're doing spec CT, the presence of nodal activity. We frequently see periprosthetic nodal activity around both infected and uninfected arthroplasties, and it gives us a mismatch on the white cell and bone marrow images. However, it is not indicative of infection. Again, with SPEC CT, you can localize this uptake to nodes if you do not have SPEC CT. More often than not, even on the planar images, you can see that uh, you see foci of activity that tend to be relatively round, discrete, oftentimes bilateral and parallel roughly nodal distribution. In the lateral view here, you can see that these foci are well anterior to the hip joint. In the case of the knee prosthesis, we see it less frequently, but when we do see it, invariably is posteriorly in the knee in the popliteal region. Uh, again, you can see this nicely on the lateral view, and once again, an area of mismatch. For whatever reason, I don't have an explanation for that, but that in and of itself is not indicative of infection, and we simply discount that. In terms of quality control, occasionally the sulfur colloid preparation, for whatever reason, breaks down, and it can interfere with the interpretation of the study, and a very simple quality assurance test is a five-minute image of the pelvis and urinary bladder, and here you can see that uh, there's a large amount of activity in the bladder with virtually no marrow activity in the pelvis, indicating that the sulfur colloid preparation uh, has been, uh, or the sulfur colloid itself is, is, uh, has failed, and it's not suitable for interpretation. There has not been a lot new in white cell marrow imaging of prosthetic joint infections over the past several years, and what I presented is a review of what you probably already know. But about, or I should say at last year's uh, Society of Nuclear Medicine and Molecular Imaging meeting, we decided to go back and look at white cell marrow imaging in infections of recently implanted arthroplasties. And as I said, at the beginning of this uh, session, about two-thirds of the lower extremity arthroplasty infections develop within one year after implantation. And yet, surprisingly, if you go back and review the data, and if you looked at the paper or have seen the paper that we published in seminars in nuclear medicine, very little data are available on the role of nuclear medicine imaging of prosthetic joint infections 
during that first year after implantation. There's been work done on cemented hip arthroplasties, uh, uninfected asymptomatic cemented and porous coated hip, arthrop uh, hip arthroplasties with the bone scan, but no systematic study of infected arthroplasties, either with bone scintigraphy or with labeled leukocyte imaging or more recently with FDG. So we decided to go back and look at our database to see the results of white cell marrow imaging in this population. And we looked at a total of 150 lower extremity arthroplasties, 110 of which were more than a year old, and 40 of which were one year old or less, including a small subgroup of 15 arthroplasties that were three months old or less. All of these patients went to surgery. So we had histopathology and microbiologic confirmation of the final diagnosis in all cases, as well as access to the operative reports themselves. And you can see that in overall, the 150 arthroplasties, infection and aseptic loosening were roughly equally divided and accounted for 90% of the failures in total with 10% miscellaneous causes. Uh, in the arthroplasties that were uh, less than a year old, the infection, and less than three months old, the infection rate was quite a bit higher, 70% 67%, with fewer cases of aseptic loosening. But when we look at the results of white cell marrow imaging, we can see that within those uh, joint replacements, three months old or less, 100% sensitivity, 80% specificity, 93% accuracy. Those 40 in total, including these 15, again, equally good results, high sensitivity, specificity, and com excuse me, compared very favorably with the devices that were more than one year old. So based on this, we conclude that we can conclude that labeled leukocyte marrow imaging is useful during that first year following implantation of the arthroplasty. There are and there continue to remain unanswered questions about combined white cell marrow imaging. For example, factors affecting the intensity of white cell uptake and prosthetic joint infection have no idea why in some cases it's very intense and in other cases it's very faint. Doesn't seem to be related to the organisms, but we really don't know. What about the effects of antibiotic therapy on sensitivity? No good data exist on that. And, follow the, follow, and finally, neither we nor anyone else has used white cell marrow imaging for monitoring response or even attempting to use it for monitoring response to antibiotic therapy. There are alternatives to in vitro labeled white cell imaging. People have used the anti-granulocyte uh, antibody to TC99M bacillesimab, which is a murine monoclonal G1 immunoglobulin. Visual analysis has sensitivity has ranged from 67 to 91%, specificity 57% to 75%. By performing bone imaging in addition to bacillesimab imaging or using semi-quantitative analysis, sensitivity is uh, about the same and there is an improvement in specificity. Silesimab is a uh, anti antibody, uh, excuse me, is a fragment. It binds to the nonspecific cross-reactive antigen 90 on leukocytes. Visual image analysis, variable sensitivity, variable specificity, dual time point imaging, time activity curve analysis, and the addition of marrow imaging improve the accuracy of the test. Both bezalesimab and sulesimab are limit, have limited availability. What about the role of SPECT CT in prosthetic joint infection? Well, Felipe et al. a few years ago looked at technetium labeled white cells and reported 100% accuracy versus 64% accuracy for planar imaging. Tam et al. looked at bone SPECT CT and reported that the SPECT CT component identifies abnormalities that are 100% sensitive and 87% specific for infection. Al Ibnani et al. reported that bone spec CT contributed useful information in more than 83% of the cases. Kim et al. said that tech labeled white cell imaging, uh, tech labeled white cell spec CT was 93% accurate for prosthetic joint infection. Graude et al. found that with the anti granulocyte antibody bezalesimab, accuracy went, uh, was 77% versus 61% for planar imaging. <clears throat> 
in our own experience, and, and we certainly haven't published it yet, but in our own experience, we have not found that SPEC CT improves the accuracy of the diagnosis of prosthetic joint infection, but we do find it useful uh, in evaluating the extent of the infection insofar as the distribution of abnormal labeled leukocyte uptake corresponds to infection. Now, in this case, you can see an obvious mismatch, and yes, it does actually extend up into the region of the hip joint, although it's most dramatic here along the lateral margin of the prosthesis. And on the SPEC CT, it provides us with a very nice delineation of the abnormal accumulation of labeled leukocytes. Another case, once again, a mismatch, again, most striking in the left, uh, in the left hip joint itself. And here you can see very nicely the abnormal labeled leukocyte accumulation, uh, slightly lateral to, but primarily posterior to the hip joint. This focus here happens to be an area of bone marrow on the sulfur colloid image. Uh, these are simultaneous dual isotope acquisitions. Here's a patient with an infected left total hip replacement and a sinus tract. Uh, the referring service knew about the collection in the thigh, but they weren't sure whether or not extended whether or not extended into the hip itself. But you can even see on the planar images, it looks like there's a sinus tract. Again, notice the discordance with the marrow image. And on the spec CT, I'm just showing the white cell image. You can see very nicely the abnormal labeled leukocyte accumulation. Here's that soft tissue abscess, and you can see tracking of the infection extending from the abscess all the way up into the area of the hip replacement. So again, in our hands, we have not found SPEC CT improves the accuracy or contributes to the accuracy of white cell marrow imaging for diagnosing infection. It does seem to be useful to evaluate the extent of infection, and that can provide useful information for preoperative planning. Perhaps with SPEC CT, after completion of your study, if you have the available personnel and the qualified individuals, rather than sending the patient for a separate CT, you may be able to perform CT guided joint aspiration you may be able to identify other causes of failure such as loosening, fracture, particle disease, and so forth, but I really have to emphasize that that is highly dependent on the quality of the CT component in your spec CT. You're not going to be able to do much about other causes of failure if you have a flat panel CT or a low-dose non-diagnostic CT. You need a sophisticated CT. Some of the images that I showed you here were done with a quote-unquote six-slice diagnostic CT, and I still do not believe at all that that is sufficient. You really need a much higher-end CT. To, to be able to make use of it. And here you can see just the amount of artifact that we see on our own studies. What about FDG and prosthetic joint infection? Well, in contrast to the consistently um, uniform and excellent results that have been obtained with leukocyte marrow imaging over now more than 30 years. The results of FDG uh, over about 20 years of investigation have been somewhat more inconsistent. Some of the early papers reported a high accuracy ranging from the high 80s up to the mid 90s. Subsequent data were, were less encouraging, however, where the accuracy was as low as 69% in the Stumpy series and was variable in some of these others, actually 67% in the Garcia series. Um, what about comparing FDG to conventional scintigraphy? Well, Reinhardt's et al., comparing it with bone scintigraphy, found that FDG was more accurate than bone scintigraphy. Stumpy found just the opposites. Bone scintigraphy was more accurate than FDG. Van Quickenborn looked at bone white cell marrow imaging and found that it was uh, superior to FDG, as did, as did Van Acker. Pill looked at white cell marrow imaging and found that FDG was more accurate than scintigraphy. Love looked at, uh, at white cell marrow imaging and compared it to FDG and found just the opposite. Okay. And here's an example of asymptomatic bilateral hip arthroplasties, one of which shows increased periprosthetic uptake on the FDG component, uh, on, the, on uh, the FDG study, and the contralateral, the left side, showing no increased 
periprosthetic activity, and this just happens to be bladder activity here with those arrowheads. Other radiopharmaceuticals, there's been a paper published on antimicrobial peptides, reported 100% accuracy a few years ago, but to the best of my knowledge, that's the only paper using antimicrobial peptides uh, for prosthetic joint infection that, have been, that has been published. In summary then, in terms of prosthetic joint infection, at the moment, leukocyte marrow imaging remains the best imaging test available for the diagnosis. If you're going to use the bone scan, consider it uh, primarily as a screening test. I don't believe that there's any role for gallium-67 imaging at the current time, and I think that after nearly 20 years of investigation, there have been no conclusive data about FDG one way or the other, and I think it's reasonable to conclude that, at least as the present time, FDG PET, PET-CT, has little or no utility for this indication. Thank you very much. We may have uh, maybe at the end, but for now we'll go on with the next speaker, which is uh, Idiel Noriega uh, from Spain, uh, Ciudad Real. He's going to speak to us about molecular imaging in diabetic patients with infections. So, Idiel, we'll, we may have to. Yes. Okay. Thanks. Welcome. Uh, and good afternoon. Uh, sorry. Um, I'm sorry, we are not going to have time to put the questions. So, uh, please. No problem. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, Chairman. I would like to thank to the organization, and especially to Mike, for the invitation, and thank for the opportunity. Uh, I'm going to talk about molecular imaging in diabetic patients with infection. Uh, as, as diabetic mellitus uh, incidence increase worldwide, uh, people who suffer this pathology uh, live longer. So many organ systems uh, seem to be affected by this pathology, especially uh, diabetic food complication increase uh, dramatically. Diabetic food is a clinical alteration of neuropathic origin induced by sustained hyperglycemia with or without coexistent ischemia with previous traumatic trigger, and all of these can produce food injury with or without ulcer. The 25% uh, uh, of the diabetic population has a high risk of super ulcer pedal. Up to 50% develop infection, and 85% of them uh, have preceded by foot ulceration. So, foot ulceration is the most frequent cause of non-traumatic lower extremity amputation, with a mortality rate around 15% at one year, uh, up to 70% at 10 years. The main differential diagnosis uh, with osteomyelitis in diabetic food is Charcot neuroarthropathy. Why? Uh, because both pathologies ha, ha, have a bone involvement. Both have similar uh, clinical presentation with similar, similar histopathological change, but a very different treatment and different management. So it's very important, an early diagnosis, and here play an important role in imaging techniques. We have uh, morphological imaging as, uh, as the X-ray, ultrasonography, computer tomography, and uh, the test of choice many times in this case is MRI, but uh, sometimes it, it cannot differentiate osteomyelitis versus uh, Charcot neuroarthropathy. And also there are uh, more patients uh, that uh, in which are not suitable because they are claustrophobic, they have uh, osteo osteosynthesis material, etc. And then uh, nuclear medicine image play an important role. Uh, here we can, we have a bone scan, white blood cell level, and FTG PET. A bone scan is an exploration where we can see uh, accumulation of the tracer in areas of bone turnover and increased activity of osteoblasts. It's a very cheap and available test, highly sensitive, because a negative uh, bone scan can exclude uh, bone involvement, but it's lower specific, and a positive bone scan uh, has a an unclear diagnosis, so it cannot differentiate between Charcot versus another infection or some other pathology uh, 
uh, for example, we have here two patients with very similar uh, image in bone scan, uh, high hyperemia and high uptake in the first toe of the right foot, of the right foot but the first row uh, is an osteomyelitis and the second one is another pathology, in this case a fracture. So here it's not very useful bone scan and we have to use a more specific test as leukocyte scan with indium, technetium, or anti-granulocyte mononuclear antibody. Here, uh, in this exploration, we can see level leukocyte migration of, fixi of fixation into infectious or inflammatory focus. It's a very useful uh, in, in peripheral skeleton, skeleton uh, with high sensitivity, high specificity, and also uh, it can differentiate charcot versus infection but uh, it could appear bone marrow take. Um, sometimes we need to perform 24-hour uh, image uh, post-injection, so the exploration could take two days. And there are also biological, biological risks because of the manipulation of uh, blood samples and also need a laborious preparation. Uh, here we can see the distribution of labelled leukocyte. Uh, if you remember, the Europe Association of Nuclear Medicine recommend three-point image. The first one at 30 minutes, the second one at two or four hours, and the last one at 20 hours. Uh, and the last one is optionally, but I consider that it's very, very important to make the differentiation between infection and inflammation. Uh, if you follow the, the yellow line corresponding to inflammation, we can see an increasing uptake up to two or four hours, but then a decrease uh, over time. By contrast, in acute or subacute inf infection, we can see an increasing uptake over time, all the time. So here, with the last image, we can make the differentiation between both pathologies. Uh, we consider a positive study uh, if we have an increasing activity uh, in intensity on extension, as we can see in this image where we can see in the middle foot an increasing uptake. By contrast, we consider a negative study where there are no uptake or a decreasing uptake, which, which, which is considered as inflammation without infection. In this case, there are no uptake of lable leukocytes. Uh, as, as ENM Infection Committee recommend, we must to acquire three points of image with time corrected decay, and we have to use uh, spec CT if possible. Uh, in our hospital, uh, last year we, we want to confirm this, but uh, we want to use eight hour image in that 20 hours. And, and then we have only one day protocol, and if you can see, the results are very good. And comparing our one-day protocol with two-day protocol from, from literature, the results are very similar, in, even uh, higher in some aspects. So uh, in order to confirm the reproducibility, also we analyzed 57 patients with osteosynthesis material um, the image was reviewed by four nuclear medicine specialists uh, blind to other diagnostic tests or to the clinical course. And uh, we calculate a, a kappa index. The result was considerable. So using this methodology, we can avoid uh, inter-observer uh, inter variability. The last one uh, will be uh, PET FTG in, uh, in order to evaluate metabolism in some lesion. With this exploration, we have a high contrast lesion versus background, and in, two or, uh, in one or two hours, we have the whole study. There is, nothing, there is not necessary a manipulation of blood with a higher spatial resolution um, comparing uh, to the combined study of bone scan, leukocyte scan, and bone barrel scan could be cheapest. But nevertheless, it's a very expensive study with the low availability, uh, hyperglycemia uh, could affect this procedure, 
and there are no difference in inflammation or infection, and the SUF value is not validated in patients with this kind of process. Uh, as diabetes mellitus is a multidisciplinary pathology, uh, in Milan in 2012, many specialties had a meeting and then uh, performed a diagnostic flow chart in order to uh, be more consensus, and they published in 2014 in the Quarterly Journal of Nuclear Medicine and Molecular Imaging. Uh, here is the diagnostic flow chart proposed. Um, if, you, if, you, if you can see the nuclear medicine image, uh, can be used in case of equivocal X-ray, in case of equivocal MRI. Then we can use leukocyte scan, SPEC CT or FDG PET CT. Both are hybrid techniques. They are very important because they improve localization of the lesion with higher sensitivity, specificity, and diagnosis accuracy. With lower equivocal result, and also we can differentiate bone from so far, especially in four foot because of the size bone. But uh, it's mean for the patient more irradiation and could appear movement artifacts. And for the uh, nuclear physician, it means more occupation of the gamma camera and more time for processing or analyzing the image. In the literature, there are many papers about uh, SPEC CT uh, in diabetic food evaluation. One of the advantages of use is, is the clinical impact, as Eva uh, et al. Uh, demonstrated in 2013 using dual isotope. SPEC CT. They analyzed uh, 227 patients with SPEC CT and 232 uh, with another conventional image. If we um, can see in the first row, there are an high, uh, a high uptake in intercuniform uh, joint without any uptake in leukocyte scan. So it means there is an inflammation, in this case arthritis. But in the second patient, uh, there are a mild uh, uptake in bone scan corresponding with a high uptake in leukocyte scan uh, in soft tissue and bone involvement, so it's indicating osteomyelitis. They conclude that using a SPEC CT in leukocyte scan, they have better diagnosis and localization of the infection comparing with another conventional image. Uh, it provides a guide for surgery with lower amputation and shorter hospitalizations. Uh, Lefontaine in 2016 uh, want to compare leukocyte scan with MRI and they analyzed one, uh, one, 110 patients and the leukocyte scan SPEC CT diagnosis accuracy was very similar to MRI as you can see on the table. Also, another utility of SPEC CT is in order to evaluate the antibiotic response, uh, antibiotic therapy response. Uh, confirm um, with the negative study after antibiotic therapy, uh, we can confirm the resolution, as demonstrate both studies. Here, I'm going to show you a couple of clinical cases. Uh, it's a diabetic man with 65 years old and left foot ulcer and suspecting bone involvement. Here we can see the three-point planar image with an increasing uptake over time. And in order to uh, discard bone involvement, we perform a spec CT. In this case, in this case we can see a 3D reconstruction where a uh, red focus uh, corresponds with label leukocyte when it's bone involvement and confirmed later by a positive culture uh, with Staphylococcus aureus. Another patient uh, is a male with 60, 74 years old and suspicion of osteomyelitis. If you uh, look at this, there are a small focal uptake in both images, and in order to discard bone involvement, we perform a SPEC CT, and then the focal uptake is just on soft tissue without bone involvement. So in this case, there are no osteomyelitis. Also, in PET-CT, there are 
uh, numerous um, many papers about diabetic food evaluation. Um, one, utili one utility of the PET CT is uh, in order to uh, confirm if soft tissue or bone are affected. Uh, in this case, in the first uh, patient, we can see uh, isolated swelling in soft tissue without, with a surrounding uptake without, affect, without bone, bone involvement. So in this case, there are no osteomyelitis. But by contrast, uh, in this case, we can see an intramedular uh, uptake uh, corresponding with bone destruction on CT and uh, indicating osteomyelitis in this case. Uh, but uh, what if we uh, perform three-time image on PET CT? Well, familiarly, uh, in 2011, want to try this and analyze uh, 30 patients comparing a leukocyte scan and PET CT in, at, at 10 minutes, one hour, and two hours. Here we can see an example uh, of the lesion in the second two. Um, and in here is the leukocyte scan where we can see an increase of uptake over time. Uh, in the same localization, there are an, an, a high uptake in, in PET CT. Uh, as, as we can see on the tables, uh, diagnostic performance uh, in PET CT is lower than leukocyte scan. Um, at the end, uh, last year, uh, Chiara et al. Uh, performed a meta-analysis comparing the most used image in diagnosis in, in diabetic food infection, uh, comparing PET-CT, leukocyte uh, scan with indium and leukocyte scan with tenesio versus MRI. As we can see, the sensitivity is very similar in all of the exploration, but uh, PET-CT and leukocyte scan with tenesium had the highest specificity. Uh, also, there are some limitations in, in many studies because only two studies with uh, leukocyte scan use the methodology proposed by EM. Um, and also in leukocyte scan, there was a lacking of 24-hour or additional spec CT. And also there was a previous uh, bone scan, so there was a preselection of patients. In PET CT, also the, there was a CT logging, uh, uh, the CT co-registration uh, obtaining a lower sensitivity than MRI. Uh, regarding with the comparison of osteomyelitis and Charcot neuroarthropathy, there are controversial results using PET-CT because many studies report can that can, ch can diagnose Charcot arthropathy and to distinguish osteomyelitis from a joint infection or neuropathic soft tissue. But another uh, studies uh, said that only can detect a minority of patients with osteomyelitis with motion artifact and limited spatial resolution because the, the small and anatomical structure. So, uh, nowadays, there are no studies with large series comparing PET-CT versus leukocyte scan PET, uh, spec CT using uh, time decay and correct acquisition or unlaid image. So currently, uh, white blood cell scan is still used for diagnosis of osteomyelitis in diabetic food. But, uh, what if we uh, lab leukocyte and use on PET CT? Well, in 2016, uh, some author uh, uh, tried to do this in 23 patients comparing MRI versus FDG PET CT and FDG lab leukocyte PET CT. Here we can see the MIP of FDG PET, where we can see a diffuse uh, and a high uptake in the mid and forefoot but comparing the same image using FDG level leukocyte PET CT, we can see the higher uptake in the skin corresponding to a foot ulcer. So there were obtained very good results, but, but in, in despite um, of, encouraged, of this encouraged result, the level in efficacy and stability was lower than SPEC CT uh, in leukocyte scan. Uh, 
Also, glycemia levels could affect this procedure. And um, because of uh, the very short half, In half we life... Have to, we have to conclude. Sorry? We have to conclude now. Uh, <laughs> and because of the short half-life, uh, there is impossible to perform uh, dual uh, time, uh, dual image. Uh, but uh, there are alternatives of uh, Cooper 64 uh, with a half-life of... 12 hours, and it's more suitable for these objectives. Also, there are another tracer as Zirconium-89 and Gallium-68, but more investigation are needed. Uh, moving on, uh, on conclusion, I want to highlight that bone scan negative exclude uh, bone involvement. Uh, time decay and correct acquisition in leukocyte scan made possible the differential diagnosis uh, of infection versus inflammation with a very high reproducibility. Um, SPECT CT has no contribution with negative planar scan. Um, hybrid techniques increase diagnosis accuracy and also uh, uh, is useful in therapy monitoring. Um, uh, nowadays, uh, leukocyte scan with tenesium and PET-CT offer the highest specificity, but uh, in PET-CT also there are uh, controversial results in differential diagnosis of osteomyelitis and Charcot neuroarthropathy. So uh, currently, uh, leukocyte scan is still used in diagnosis of diabetic foot infection, but perhaps in the future, I think uh, PET-CT could replace uh, leukocyte scan. Thank you very much. Thanks, Idel. Idel is the newest member of the ISOB Presidium. He's uh, going to be seen uh, frequent. Then we, ne we move to the next speaker, and the last speaker, which is uh, Victoria Sorova, former president of the ISOB, is going to speak to us about which, where, and when to select a radio antibiotic, radio labeled whole body scan, um, white blood scan, and the peptides for infection and inflammation. Victoria, thanks. Uh, thank you. And being the last is not so bad because everyone talked and, I mean, I don't have much to say. So, uh, I have no disclosures and no conflicts. Outcomes and objectives to resolve infection inflammation pathologies. We are going to revise radiolabel antibiotics, leukocytes and peptides available in my country. Argentina, knowledge on mode of action, biodistribution, application, considering time of event, site, and clinical presentation. Possibilities, depending on technical staff and reporting expertise of the people, new instrumental capabilities, and remember FDG, F18, and PET-CT. We must ask ourselves, are we going to choose a technician radio tracer with spec CT or an FDG F18 radio molecule with PET CT or PET NMR? In the era of molecular imaging, is the technician radio tracer still competitive? It depends on the dosimetry, on the biodistribution, and capability of obtaining a high resolution image with the available instrumentation. Keep in mind, instrumental advances, new reconstructive algorithms and software have approximated spec resolution to PET. The chemical versatility of technician 99M different oxidative states allows radio labeling of new molecules with high specificity. All this should be taken in account when a radio tracer is selected or when you doubt if its use is still advantageous. About radio label leukocytes, we have heard from uh, Kutlan, Oscar, all what we could hear. But some history. In 1976, Professor Matthew Thakur and John McAfee introduced radio label blood elements with Indium 111 and its clinical application. His first label leukocytes was his own blood. In 1989, in Vienna, Isorbe was created and registered, and since then, radio label leukocytes uh, with technician 99 appeared in the infection inflammation scenery. 
first with molecular colloids, then with HMPAO, and now with the Australian colloid methodology where you inject whole blood. We take in consideration the radio label autologous cells have a standardization uh, methods for clinical use, and this has been published in the Human Health Series. But remember, it is a time-consuming technique, as we have already heard. All step performs under sterile conditions, equipment class A, laminar flow cabinet, centrifuge with variable angle rotor dose calibrators, we must calculate labeling efficiency and the quality control and procedure of the acquisitions. And don't forget the trained personnel. This comes from uh, Dr. Palestro, and we uh, again see that the great difference in accepting loosening and infection cellularity are the presence of great quantity of neutrophils in the infection. Uh, we have already heard by uh, the biography procedural guidelines that one was uh, from ISORBI in 1998, another in 2009. Um, we have the Brie and Roca um, in the European Journal of Nuclear Molecular Imaging 2010, and now in 2017, in December, for the European Journal of Nuclear Medicine, we are going to have very soon guidelines for spi spine infection, prosthetic joint, peripheral bone infection, and diabetic foot. Here is only an image um, of the labeling of white cells in a flow cabinet, here when you see with the spec CT, and here the control quality performed uh, in um, images uh, of a um, doctor that has, had um, assisted to the training course of uh, Professor Kutland. And fusion imaging decreases the equivocal results and gives a better depiction of anatomical details. Pedal ulcer in diabetic foot with labeled leukocyte with indium. You see the positivity. In a prosthesis infection in the right uh, knee, you can see the infection. And in a double prosthesis, you can see infection in the stem of the prosthesis in both replacements. Here we have in the left knee. Uh, the left knee, which uh, shows um, activity, and with the SPECT CT, you can very easily depict that the infection is in the soft tissue and in the, in the bone. Here is hybrid SPECT images uh, that will show you different uh, uptake. One is the bone scan, and also the labeled leukocytes. So uh, they are showing both activity, but the distribution is different. Another hybrid image of the spine, and you can see here very well that we have not only activity in the bone, but also in the soft tissue. In an endocarditis of native tricuspidic valve, after the substitution, we had the activity of the tricuspidic, but the substitution was on the mitral. This you can only achieve with the spec CT. And please do remember that sometimes photon negative leukocytes may also indicate infection, as by example in an embolism of the spleen and here in the spine. Also, not very frequent, you can have a false positive FDG PET with a true negative spec CT leukocyte with technician 99M, as is happening here. This is the positivity in the FDG, false positive, and negative in the leukocyte technician. Leukocytes accumulate in the bone marrow, Professor Christopher Pub. Uh, Palestro published and gave an excellent talk, but I have to make you remember this. Leukocytes and marrow imaging to solve the dilemma. 
if you are uh, labeling leukocytes with technician, you must wait 48 hours between both studies. The principle of leukocyte marrow imaging has been uh, very well um, told to us. So uh, in order to hurry up, because we have little time, I will only say that leukocyte uptake is higher, and when sulfur color is low, then you can think that it is infected. And here you have the uh, positivity in the indium white blood cells and the absence in the sulfur colloid. And here you have a negative study, positive in both studies. Now, ciprofloxacin technician 99M called Infecton. This we uh, work a lot in Argentina. I have more than 2,500 patients. Uh, the ciprofloxacin inhibits bacterial DNA gyrase that has four subunits. The human enzyme has only two subunits, so not compromised by quinolones. Uh, we have a ready-made uh, kit uh, that the, um, the companies sell for us, so it is very easy. Uh, it has two milligrams of ciprofloxacin in an infecton kit, which is 200 times less than a therapeutic dose, and no restriction of adverse reactions. And we do not need to suspend the antibiotic that the patient is receiving. Uh, we did also uh, work with ceftisoxime uh, with Professor Martin Comin in Barcelona. And I want to remember that ciprofloxacin, we worked with St. Bartholomew's Hospital with uh, Keith Britton. And here you have the formulas of each of the antibiotics. Uh, this is the way we received in the first time our ciprofloxacin. We performed some animal models. And here you can see the positivity uh, in um, the groin of the um, uh, rabbit. And here is a control. Um, just uh, we do uh, um, proceed uh, with the images um, from very early, we make a flow study. We make uh, one hour images, four hours and 24 hours. Um, with all our studies, we now only do the flow study, four hours and 24 hours. And you can see here the biodistribution bio and how the lungs become clear at 24 hours. Um, this is an infecton. It was positive uh, around the prosthesis, and you can see that um, the spec CT uh, was more important than the planar image. Um, here we have um, a double prosthesis in um, the knees, and both prostheses were um, inflamed. They were not infected. And how do we uh, know that? Because we did some, um, in the planar images, we did semi-quantification, and we got that the relation at four hours for the right side uh, was 1.3, and in the left side, it was 1.1. And at 24 hours, it came up, but very little. So we say this is an inflammation. And we had um, biopsy, and they were, it was not infected. Uh, we do follow up for therapy monitoring. Uh, here you can see the prosthesis and the elements of the prosthetic. And we have here um, the first image, which um, is positive, the same as the bone scan um, performed in this patient, but the distribution is much less extended. Uh, the other um, follow-up study showed that uh, we still had an infection, but it was uh, a little bit less active. And then in the last um, follow-up spec CT study, we told the uh, doctor that it was uh, improving and he might start thinking to stop antibiotics. Here we had a soft tissue infection in the left shoulder we had the first study, and in the second study, you see how it is resolving. And in the first scan, the semi-quantitation, 
gave uh, five point something for the relation uh, at four hours, and it was maintained four point something for the uh, 24 hours. And in the second scan, it dramatically came down to 120. Professor Signori Ferroflores published in August 2017 in the Quarterly Journal of Nuclear Medicine and Molecular Imaging a comparative work on Technician 99 UBI, Technician Ciprofloxacin, and a new molecule of Technician Ciprofloxacin dithiocarbamate. And also he compared with Indian 111 biotin in the detection of Escherichia coli and Staphylococcus aureus in vitro and in animal models. Labeling with high efficiency all the mentioned agents, which showed poor detecting efficiency for in vitro dead bacteria at different temperatures, but it was excellent for detection of living bacteria. Ciprofloxacin with this new molecule showed high bacterial union in vitro and in vivo with better performance than the predecessor compound of ciprofloxacin technician, which was the infecton of Keith Brittle. Uh, I am showing now some images of the ceftisoxin, which was the other antibiotic, and we compared both antibiotics. Uh, they worked similarly. Uh, but the best um, detection was for Staphylococcus aureus, and this was at 21 hours. Here I show you the positive scans of both Infecton and Ceftisoxim. The distribution is nearly the same. And um, here is a bone scan and uh, culture Staphylococcus aureus positive in the same way and the same distribution of the white blood cells. So maybe we should change the concept and search specific agents for a specific disease infection and not thinking that one radio label tracer would give you the answer to everything. So we have other antibiotics and other bacterial radio agents uh, the, it was published as parfloxacin technician, moxifloxacin, enrofloxacin, isoniazid, etambutol, and other chemical species of known radio compounds. Uh, just to mention, we have a fluor, fluor metal trios in PET CT labels, the bacterial metrodextrin transporter. And here you can see uh, the detection of an infection. Um, wow. The detection of an infection with a very uh, small quantity of uh, bacterial, and then how, when it is um, in the follow up images, um, this had disappeared. Um, also, uh, there is technician labeled peptides for infection and inflammation, which is the antimicrobial peptides preferentially bind to membrane of bacteria over mammalian cells and therefore discriminate between infection and inflammation. Antimicrobial peptides. These antimicrobial peptides, part of the natural defenses of living organisms, are small, cationic, and amphipathic, either hydrophilic or hydrophobic, and their expression may be constant or induced on contact with microbes. Radio labeled synthetic fragments of ubiquicidin, which is present in murine macrophage, have been most extensively studied. Antimicrobial peptides, technician 99M, the 2941, appears to be sensitive and specific for musculoskeletal infections and shows promise for monitoring treatment response. And uh, um, Dr. Mike Satehi has also labeled them with FDG with uh, very good results. Uh, here you can see the uh, formula of the ubiquicidine. Um, and two images, one of the feet and one of the um, hand, and both 
give a very good positivity and none of them give uh, bad results nor have um, side effects for the patient. Very positive activity of the bone in the cervical and also the osteomyelitis of this UBI in the leg. The limitations of the ubiquicidin, false positives related to high vascularized tumors, false negatives for low labeling quality, because this is not a kit and this you have to do it in uh, the radiopharmacist. No differentiation with imaging of different pathogens, not useful in detecting intracellular pathogens. So considerations in the era of FDG F18. Why should you use FDG F18? It has good resolution of the equipment, but poor specificity. It, you can detect early, but the dosimetry is high and the cost is high. FDG uptake in infection is based on the fact that mononuclear cells and granulocytes use large quantities of glucose by way of the excess monophosphate shunts like that of neoplasm. Expression of leukocytes, glucose transporters, it's uh, up when it is infected. Serum glucose levels should be low. Presence of receptor blocking substances, including intrinsic proteins and receptor blocking medications such as angiotensin receptor blockers. Activation of the respiratory bars. This cartoon you know by heart. So, only an image to show you the right sacroiliitis, very well depicted with FDG F18. And not all what you see uptake is an infection or a tumor. So here we have an insufficient fracture after pelvic radiation in a woman with breast cancer. Conclusions. Label leukocytes are still the most useful specific nuclear medicine exam for the diagnosis of inflammation and infection, especially for peripheral adult bone, osteomyelitis, fractures and implants, fever of unknown origin, vascular grafts, endocarditis, diabetic foot and soft tissue. Radioantibiotics gained a place for skeletal, muscular, and soft tissue infections. Fluor 18 FDG alone or labeling leukocytes with positrons, not with FDG, will contribute to a larger use of these techniques, improving the accuracy, maybe fungal infections, sarcoid endocarditis. Early identification and localization of the site of infection is crucial. The new hybrid cameras will produce a more accurate diagnostic, improving the localization of infectious focals with all radio label markers. And nevertheless, the need for an infection specific tracer has not yet ended and still continues. So that's all. And this is what we do best in Argentina we eat meat and we dance tango. Mm -hmm. Thanks, uh, colleagues. Uh, um, I'd like to give uh, Idel uh, for appreciation uh, for his uh, presentation. The other speakers have already had in theirs. Could I ask if there's any burning question to the uh, four speakers? Maybe we can take two questions before we close to all the four of them. Uh, okay. If there's nothing, well, uh, this concludes the session, and I would like to thank you for being attentive. <laughs>